So now it's time to race through a lot of examples of quick tests. In the last class, I described tours as information gathering techniques, and they are. But today, use a tour to hunt for user interface bugs. Look for implementation errors and design annoyances. Pretend you brought your seven-year-old son with you on the tour. Watch him press all the buttons and twiddle all the knobs. What breaks? And what aspects of the design make your inner seven-year-old want to throw a tantrum? I've talked about boundaries already. Now think beyond the boundaries to overflows or underflows. Values that are too large or too small for the machine to even properly process. Some of these are tests of inputs, but you can overflow calculations and stored values too. If you can influence the value of a variable, any variable, input, output, calculation result, if you can influence that value, you can test its limits and you can try slamming far past them. Calculations fail for many reasons. The quick tests check for the simple routine bugs that programmers accidentally allow in their calculations. Getting to these early in testing can prevent a lot of bugs. Suppose a programmer is sloppy about guarding for divide by zero. If you start finding divide by zeros when the program is 20% complete, you give the programmer the opportunity to improve how he writes the next 80% of the code. I have to raise a note of warning here. It would be a serious mistake to think you've done an adequate job of testing a program's calculations if all you run are a bunch of quick tests. For example, consider a program that inverts a matrix. These are subject to rounding errors, and they can be huge if the programmer doesn't manage the calculations correctly. You can design powerful tests to assess how vulnerable the program is to rounding errors, but you will have to specify a value for every cell in the matrix, not just one or two variables' values. These are not quick tests. It takes time and a lot of work to learn a program well enough to understand which calculation risks are plausible enough to be worth investing in, and to design the sets of data that you need to maximize the power of your calculation tests. Another good choice for quick tests is initial state bugs. Many programmers forget to initialize their variables, or they forget to reinitialize them, or they accidentally reinitialize them after they've been used. One of the most important reasons to start testing as early as you can and why many testers start with quick tests is that if you demonstrate weaknesses in the programmer's coding practices, you can prevent those types of bugs now instead of hunting for them later. But remember your context when you're called in to do early testing. The project manager wants you working early for a reason. If your mission is to help the programmers design unit tests, but you decide to run a bunch of black box quick tests, you might find a lot of bugs. But as a service provider, you fail. Choose your techniques to support your mission. Here are a couple of examples of initial state tests. The best way to work through these is to try them with the program that you're testing. Initial state tests are about what happens when you first use a variable or you restore it to a first use state. But what about when you've been using a variable for a while? It has a value and you change it. The risk is that different parts of the program might depend on the same variable. If they do, then changing it for one part might cause a problem for the other part. This issue reflects an important design risk called coupling. Two parts of a program are coupled if they depend on the same variable. The more tightly coupled the program is, the more side effects you get when you change variables' values. If the program works perfectly, those side effects are intentional. Change this and the change propagates all over the system. But unless the programmer manages this carefully, some of those effects will sometimes be unexpected. The control flow of a program describes what it's going to do next. A control flow error happens if it does the wrong thing next. Now you might find it useful to pull down all the menus and try every visible option. If the programmer hasn't run the basic control flow tests, this tour of the user interface controls will probably find some bugs. But don't be surprised if these tests don't find much. I laid out a variety of control flow errors in testing computer software, but I'd rather use glass box techniques and code inspections to find most of them. If the control flow is confusing to me when I read the code, yeah, I'd certainly run black box tests to see what's going on. But these aren't quick tests. They require more knowledge and a deeper investigation. In a quick test, the goal of sequence testing is to create a stack overflow or a memory leak or a serious impact on performance, all by running a test that includes lots and lots of steps or a relatively simple test many times. Some of the targets for this are anything that creates an error message, or anything that halts a task in the middle, or anything that executes the program recursively. If you're not already familiar with recursion, Robert's book, Thinking Recursively, has been very helpful to my first year programming students. When one program has to communicate with another, those communications are called messages. 
So what happens if you create bad messages? Now you should be able to block one program from establishing a connection with another, or from succeeding when it sets a command to the other. Somehow, of course, you'll need to be able to set the data in these messages. And that's something that's normally done by the program and not by a black box tester. One way to do this is to find data in a configuration file that specifies logon strings or protocol details with another program or resource. Another way, if the programmers modify the code to give you this ability, is to intercept the message and edit it. As soon as you have the ability to emulate a program that's sending data to another program, you can send severely corrupted files and see whether these will take down the receiving program or even let you go past the receiving program to execute commands at the operating system level. Alan Jorgensen used this technique to find very serious vulnerabilities in widely used commercial software. Imagine the two events can happen, A and B. And imagine the programmer knows that A will always happen before B. And writes the code with that in mind. What happens if B happens first? This is called a race condition. There are many variations. When I used to test printers, we saw lots of race conditions because separate processors handled graphics processing, page layout, and other aspects of device control. If you could slow one of those processors down, you got races. So how do you get different parts of the system to be busy, but at different speeds? Well, try overloading one of the processors by giving it a backlog of work, and not overload the other by as much. That gives you the opportunity for a race. Long sequence testing turns out to be a good tool for this because it drives the system through a long series of complex tasks in a random order. Some of those tasks push some things more than others. But setting up long sequences takes a lot of work. Apart from maybe working with a dumb monkey, I wouldn't call long sequence tests quick tests. From the point of view of quick testing, you can look for tasks that seem to be related and try to interfere with just one of those tasks. The next slides will present a bunch of ideas about interfering with a task or a subsystem. Interference testing involves two things that are happening in real time, but aren't perfectly coordinated. The trick is to do something with one of them that interferes with the other. I'm going to start with interrupts. An interrupt says to the program, hey, pay attention. Something's happening in this environment that can affect you. So for instance, here's a printer with two paper trays. Set it to pull paper from the top tray. While it's printing, pull out the bottom tray and see what happens. Now that's going to generate an interrupt. The interrupt is a message from the printer to the computer that the paper tray has come out. The operating system might forward this message to the program that's printing to this printer. What if the program misinterprets the message and thinks the top tray is out and therefore there's no paper? If you can confuse the program that way, you can confuse it further. Now that the program stopped printing because it thinks the printer is out of paper, pull out the top tray and put back the bottom tray. Does the program now think that because a paper tray is back in, the printer is ready to print? Well, if the bottom tray has the wrong size of paper, or if it's out of paper, or if the program is set to demand paper from the top tray, then the printer is still out of paper for that program because the top tray is still out. I've seen bugs like this with several programs. You get the system into a state where the program knows it can send data to the printer, and the printer knows it can't print it. So the result looks like a lockup, and occasionally you even have to do a power down reset to get out of it. Now consider the task first, rather than an external device like a printer. What things does the task rely on? Change one of those. For example, I use Adobe Premiere to create these videos. I created these slides in PowerPoint, and I save each slide as a bitmap file. Premiere links to the bitmaps on the disk. If I edit one of these slides and update to a new bitmap with the same name and put it in the same directory, the change shows up in the movie while I'm editing it. So here I've gone outside the Premiere program to change something that it relies on. And Premiere reacts to that. It's a great feature, but how many ways could that go wrong? Next, think of interfering with the program by canceling something. Imagine a big red cancel button on the printer. Start printing, press the cancel button. What result? Printing might cancel right away, or it might take a while to cancel. It might cancel at an unexpected time. And for some period of time after you press cancel, the program's impression of the status of the printer might not match the actual status. If you can create a status mismatch, then you have the opportunity to flip it so that the program thinks the printer is completing a job it's abandoned, or the program thinks the printer has stopped a job that it's actually still printing. Either mismatch could cause the program to lock, to lose track of the job being sent to the printer, or to corrupt data.